So here we are, 2021, International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. Keep going. Thank you, sir. Remember the prisoners who have changed with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. We are collectively the church in Christ's body. There's no doubt in my mind that somewhere this morning or in the entire week, people were persecuted on a physical level, a mental level, financial level, all different levels. We need to be mindful of that. The hardest thing about standing up here doing this, besides just standing up here and doing it, is trying to make it interesting. For most of us, and we've been, I tried to track back, I think we've been doing this for almost 10 years for the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. So without having to get to those the same material over and over and over again, trying to make it interesting is a challenge. So the first part of it is going to be review for those who have sat through this time and time again. But as pastor repeats himself for review purposes, often, I think it's a good thing. So this is it. This is where all the persecution takes place. It's called a 1040 window. Yes? Oh. I didn't know that was my job. Well, have a great time. Mr. Anthony does a great job up there. If you ever wanted to monitor what, what happens upstairs when these kids are up there under Anthony's tutelage, it's a gas. I'm telling you, they have a great, great time, but they soundly learn the word of God and his precepts. I mean, it's amazing what he does with those children up there. We, he's so loud. We even put the door closed up there. We have to close those doors when he teaches. He booms. It's a good time. All right, so here we are, the 1040 window. That's the 10th parallel at the bottom and the 40th at the top. The one that says 1040 window, that's the equator. That would be zero, so you can kind of get an idea where you're at. Um, Greenville, South Carolina, we're at just over 35 degrees. So you can see kind of where we are if you walked across there. But that's the entire world for the persecuted church for the most part, although there is somebody that made it over here to this continent, and that's Cuba. So that's changing in the last two years. Yes. Okay, so here's where we're going to be concentrating here inside this 1040 window. We're going to be looking at China, Malaysia, India, the Middle East, North Africa. This green thing, this Muslim thing, blew up in 2014 when ISIS walked across the Middle East. They... It was unbelievable what they were doing. It became the fastest growing religion in the world. But that's been quelled a bit, but they're still there. Two-thirds of the world's population, that's 4 billion people, live in a 1040 window. Grasp that. Two-thirds of the world's population live inside that window. So if you have China, let me go back one. Wrong way. China, 1.4 billion people, that's with a B, 1.4, and India with 1.3 billion. That's a lot of people, all right, in a very small spot. And if you take the land mass of India, it's only two-thirds of the land mass of the United States. There's 350 million in the United States, but 1.3 billion in India. So they're really packed in there. It's very crowded. So 87% of the poorest of the poor, living on an average of only $250 per family annually, not per person, per family. How do you live on $250 a year? And that's average. That means 50% of them make more, 50% make less, if you can imagine that. But a lot of the poorest of the poor that are in abject poverty do not um, live just to make a living. They live just to stay alive. They have... Uh, Things they grow, animals that they can keep to go, but money is not their thing. Basically, it says, put food on the table and keep roof over your head. In many of the 69 nations, witnessing to the Christian gospel is illegal and will result in imprisonment or death. 45 of the 50 worst countries in the world are inside that 1040 window. Child prostitution and child slavery run rampant in these nations. Horrific abuse 
horrific abuse of women and children remain unchecked, including epi epidemic of pedophilia and FGM. If you don't know what FGM is, it's female genital mutilation. If you look that up, you'll be horrified at what people do to women. It's un and it's not, they're not doing it to women, they're doing it to young girls. So, majority of the world's terrorist organizations are based in the 1040 window. So each day, 50,000 people inside that 1040 window die without hearing the gospel. 50,000 people in that one 1040 window. 150,000 die across the globe. So a third of the people who die unsaved are di dying inside this 1040 window. One third. 95% of the people are unreached. 3,800,000 unreached. All right? Big difference, and check this, because unreached and unsaved, two radically different things. Unsaved is your brother, your sister, your grandmother, your aunt, your uncle, maybe even your spouse that has heard the gospel multiple times but has not repented, okay? As opposed to the unreached, that would be anyone who has not heard the gospel of Christ. So there's 3,800,000 unreached reached people, not unsaved. They are unsaved. So all unreached are unsaved, but not all unsaved are unreached, right? Got that? It's pretty important. Unreached or unsaved, obviously, but not all unsaved are unreached. My entire family, unsaved, but they have absolutely been reached. No false conversions in any of these in persecuted countries. There's no way you're going to stand up for Jesus Christ if you haven't really been born again. You take your life, your family's life, your well-being, your living space, whatever it is, there's no way you're going to make a commitment or a spouse that you're following a Jesus Christ if you don't really. It's just, do all saved Christians, have they fallen and said yes or no? Yes, they have. We looked at stories. I remember Naomi and Ruth. I don't know if you remember that story, but there's a number of it. When ISIS was walking across the territory, they would take families, and they would put the mother and the father, and they would take your children over there, and they would say, disavow Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, or we will cut your children's throats right here. And what would you do if you were a parent? Some of them said, we can't, and they watched that. How do you process that? Some might have, and then they live with the shame and the guilt. They have to go to Christ and cry out like Peter did. Oh, my gosh, forgive me, and they would be forgiven. 26 million martyrs. More people have died for their faith in the 20th century than all previous centuries combined. Imagine that. 26 million in, so from 1999 to the year 2000, 26 million died. Put that in context for you, from 33 AD to 1999, it's only 14.3 million. Right? Big difference. So we have got almost 2,000 years for 14 million, but in a 100-year span, we have 26 million. A Christian dies for his or her, his or her faith every X number of minutes. Every year, I scramble around trying to find the number. What's the overall number? Because all these ministries all have a number. We, th we think it's this. We think it's that. We think it's this. It was a lot easier when ISIS was out there because people were keeping st stats, and it was just unbelievable. It was one every three minutes. It's, it was terrible. So I've given up looking for the number because it doesn't matter what the number is. The fact is that it takes place at all is the issue. So right now, there are an estimated 100 million Christians globally facing harassment, intimidation, arrest, violence, torture, imprisonment, and even death simply because they believe in Jesus. I suspect in the coming days, and I don't mean days, days, but the next year or two, I think we're going to suffer harassment and intimidation. I do. But look at Canada. 40 churches burned this year. 40 churches in Canada. It's in our backyard. 
In just the last year, there have been 340 million Christians living in places where they experience high levels of persecution and discrimination. 4,761 Christians killed for their faith, 4,488 churches or Christian buildings burned or attacked, 4,277 believers detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, and imprisoned. All right, there's a magic number in there that I got late while I was putting this together, and that is how many get killed per day or for per minute. So if you take 4,761 and you divide it by 365, you got 13. So 13 people get killed for their faith in Jesus Christ every day. 13 people. So he's going to reference that, all right? He's going to put, it must be important. We're going to repeat. All right, so extreme persecution. Here's where. <laughs> Want to see something? <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to get him. You want to just leave? Can you can you just walk out the door? Can you just walk out and turn it off there? Okay, if you don't have your phone on off or vibrate, you can do that for me, please. Do that right now. All right. So there's no one group of people that has all the answers. You've got to show all these different sites for all these different ministries. Open Doors is one. If you ever want to look out there, they have good, solid information all the time. So they did a map here. They do it every year for extreme persecution. There's an interesting change up here for us. China is no longer in the top 10, interesting enough. I have a reason why I think that's the case. Um, those of you who know about China, when we talked about it interest early on, was China was out there. And here's a stunning number about China. 15,000 people a day, and that's the low side. The high side is 20. 15,000 people a day come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ in China. 15,000. <laughs> okay, it's 1.4 billion people, but that's a stunning, stunning number. You can't keep enough Bibles in China to account for that. And... Another little interesting stat, China is the largest producer of Bibles on the face of the earth. <laughs> you can't have one, but they do more than anybody else. And if there's an upside to COVID, if there is one, it's for the Chinese people. There's a half a billion cameras in China, a half a billion cameras. You're tracked everywhere you go. There's 2.3 cameras per person all the time. When they had to wear masks... They could now walk down the street and they put a little hat on and a mask. All they could see is this. So they couldn't tell who was sharing the gospel. So that's the upside to wearing a mask, right? <laughs> All right, enough about China. <clears throat> so North Korea, simply the worst regime in the world right now. It's completely closed to us. We don't really know what's going on there all the time. We can't get printed Bibles in there very often, but they do a lot of electronic Bibles that they float them in by a, a, a balloon and launch them in and then fire it off at nighttime. They knew exactly what they're doing. Some really smart guys. Afghanistan, I put a triangle around this. Thank you to our uh, current administration creating a power vacuum in this area. I think we're going to see ISIS and all these other guys just rise up and it's just going to start all over again. So I think next year or the year after that, that'll probably be in flames. Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time in India today. They've spent the... Uh, They've made the top 10 list actually a year or two ago. But interesting things are taking. Uh, it's good to have Benny here. How many were here when Benny was here? How many were here when Benny was here the first time? Good. It's a good number. Great man. I was so blessed to be able to spend time with him personally this time. Uh, we probably sat down and at one space we had a dinner that took three hours. So we just talked, Michelle and I and Brother Benny. It was a great, great time. Really got to learn the heart of what that man is doing. Alpha Ministries, we express God's love by building health, hope, healing to transform lives. I don't know what happened to my text there, but, but anyway, I was really struck when he used that word, health, help, hope, and healing. And we're going to talk about those because he's doing something very unique 
with those three words that other ministries are not doing. Reaching the unreached, the, un- the unengaged, making disciples, and planting churches where no church exists. We're going to look at the unengaged, the unreached, but most importantly, the making disciples. He's doing something very unique. Again, a lot of ministries are not bothering with this. So here's something about Alpha Ministries. They've been 50 years in the making, as it were. Uh, if you don't know the story, him and his, his father and his mother, when Benny was a boy and his little brother, they moved to a little town way out of the way. They rented an apartment that was basically a shack, but it was the largest one, the cheapest one they could get. They carved out a bedroom in the back, and he got three or four men together, and he discipled them and sent them out to start a church. He did that over and over and over and over. His building grew. He got bigger apartments. Benny grew up in and all around this, so he understood, understands what takes with place. But now, this is what they're doing on a huge scale. Um, ACFA accredited Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability. The board wouldn't even let me stand up here if they didn't have that accreditation. It's not a one and done. You've got to have it every year. Stunning direct ministry dollars, 93%. There's not a lot of ministries that can break the 90% barrier. So they are 93%. So every dollar we provide, 93 cents of it goes right out back into the field. Ministry development and general administration. And they have Amazon Smiles where you can go and suck, do, uh, buy something on Amazon and a certain percentage of that will go to that ministry. So if we could get Pastor Darren to select Amazon Smiles when he shops, we can probably get that to 94%. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, so our commitment, here's where we are. We strive to fulfill Christ's mission mandate in Acts, in Acts 1, 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witness to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. If you were to spend any real time with Benny, you'd find out that the Spirit has upon him. You're saved, the Spirit is in you, E-N, in. It comes upon you, it's epi. Spirit is definitely on this man. It was a real blessing to be with him. And he's really doing this all to the ends of the earth. To reach the unreached through evangelism, that's a great opportunity. Not a lot of, I won't, I won't say a lot of ministries don't engage in evangelism, but there's a lot of Bible tossing out there where we're just handing out Bibles. Benny even told me, he goes, John Michael, I can stand, I can hand Bibles out all day. People want it because it's one, it's new, it's a book, it has value. I can hand out Bibles all day, but you've got to hand them out to the right people, and we're going to get into some of that. To mobilize disciples who make and multiply disciples, this is what they're doing. They're actually making disciples. They're taking this school, and I'm going to show you a school to you. They're actually creating disciples and teach them to go out and start churches and also make disciples. To establish vibrant fellowships of Jesus' followers, to serve their spiritual needs and their physical needs. This is another area where they really are excelling in reaching and taking care of people's physical needs. To impact the world through mission sending. So here's a school. So since they started this school, 42,000 frontline messengers and Christian leaders are trained. So you sign up for this Bible school. You're there 35 weeks straight are in the classroom. And then you go out for a couple weeks ghosting somebody, and then you're on your own, and you come back and you report. And they allow a stipend to each one of these people so that they can attend school and still be able to function in terms of putting a roof over that. It's almost like they're paying you to go to school. Well, you have to work, but by and large, they're paying you a stipend. Uh, the bearded man in the middle, that was his father. Uh, he died two years ago. Interesting, Benny was telling me that when they landed in that first apartment, he goes, there was nobody in the streets to meet them. He said, when he died, he said, there were thousands for miles while they went to uh, intern him. They all wanted something. All the pastors were all lined up. All they wanted was anything, a piece of paper, an article of clothing, something they wanted from that man. He made a huge difference, huge so here's a group of pastors. They were there for a conference, but um, nothing there. I just want to show you that they are creating pastors that are going out into the world. 
2,838 home groups actively in operation. 2,800 home groups active in, in operation. The joy of generosity, they are feeding people and clothing people and helping people medically on a huge level. Matter of fact, he's got some, I, some, uh, a group of people. It's a small village. They're people who are lower than the lower caste. They're not even welcome to be anywhere. He said, but they ride in there once every couple weeks with 90-pound bags of rice and cooking oil. Now, the government has since yeah, stopped them from doing the cooking oil. They won't give them any cooking oil. But he goes, what good would it be for me to walk in there, give them rice and a Bible? It's not going to do anything. He said, it's that old adage, they don't care what you know until they know how much you care. So then, once he's gotten these people where they trust him, they love, they believe what he's saying, then when they say that, why are you here? And he said, for the love of Christ, I'm here to serve you. Then they understand, well, who is this God? Who is this Jesus? Tell us about him. And then you've made a difference. And it, Benny's trained the men and women to be able to do this. Most people are just out there just tossing food, tossing Bibles. Huge difference about what it is they're doing. 92,000 believers baptized in the Alpha Bible churches in Asia. 28,000 study Bibles and a half a million Bibles were distributed in Seeking Hearts. Another thing that they're doing, this is extraordinary, they've taken a Thompson Chain reference Bible. They've had it translated locally into Hindu, and they're giving it to the leaders that are going out. So rather than just giving them a Bible that they have to go out and try and preach from, now they have a tool in front of them that they wouldn't normally have. I don't know of any other ministries that's out there giving study Bibles to their leadership. A great, great opportunity. And if you saw the Bible, it's definitely a Hindu Bible. I mean, it's, the cover of it is bright pink and purple and blues and gold star. It, it, it looks very Indian-ish. So here's something they're doing as well. Uh, in the last year, they have COVID and hygiene and uh, awareness camps, financial help for widows and widowers, and substantial financial help. This is kind of tied to the first one there. It costs $7,000 to, to relocate somebody. So if you're in a village and your pastor gets killed, the family, is sometimes it's, oftentimes it's too difficult for them to remain in the village because they too are at danger. Or if you get your house burned to the ground and they do that, if you're lucky to get out alive, a lot of times what they do is they bolt the doors down and set the thing on fire and kill you, all of you. But it takes $7,000 to um, relocate somebody. Healthcare workers appointed for raising an awareness of COVID-19. Ambulatory teams help people get back up on their feet. This isn't the black fungus thing. I added that. This, I didn't know anything about this. There's something over there in their ground that there's a correlation between what's happening with their bodies when they have COVID. They're more susceptible to this black fungus. They're inhaling it, and because of whatever they're going through with COVID, it's affecting their, this part of their body. A lot of them are losing their eyesight. They're having to have massive uh, surgery in their noses. But uh, it's something that they're having to deal with. Never heard of it. So those are a number of things that they're dealing with. Um, bottom there on the note, if you are a Christian, you have to pay for your hospital stay or your medical bills up front before you'll even get taken care of. So forget insurance over there. The insurance you have is hopefully somebody will do that. And that Alpha Ministries is doing that. They're paying people's doctor bills so they can get take the, uh, the care that they need. Yes, Christians have to pay for it. Everybody else gets whatever health care is available to, that, to you in that country under the norm, not the Christians. Well, so they need to find yes. So here's, here's those words again, help, hope, and healing. So help for today, hope for tomorrow, and healing and destitute. They're checking all three of those boxes. All those statistics are good, but they seem impersonal to us. You know, we go through numbers. Every time I stand up here, it's a numbers game. This number, that number, this person saved, this person died. This is, the, this is, this much Bibles were given out, this much rice was given out, this much oil was given out. It's interesting that you can look at one person being saved, but you realize all 
the time and energy and money it takes just to get to that point. From me to stand here, from somebody to donate enough money to buy a Bible, for that Bible to get over there, for that frontline leader to be able to, not immediately, but to engage with that person and finally get them to the Bible where they've led them to Christ, all that ministry, time, effort, and money for that one salvation. So the numbers, while they seem like very rote numbers that we go through and they change dramatically, think about what takes place behind. So sadly, persecution is on the rise. And if I ask you to say this out loud, we do this all the time. The church always grows through. Church always grows through persecution. persecution. Absolutely. So one of the things that was... um, 10 ways to pray for the persecuted church. When I first started looking at this was, somebody said, they never pray to stop the persecution. Do you get that? They don't ask us. They don't say, pray to stop the persecution. That's not what they ask for. They ask for a number of things, but they never say that. They understand what it is they're going through. They understand why they're going through that, and they understand who it is they're going through it for. I have a video I want to show you. This guy's a, a Hindu guy. Can I pause this real quick? I want to say something before. I don't normally bring in something like this. This is, I'm going to just try it. It's not bloody, but there's a little bit of gratuitous violence. Uh, basically, it's two pastors are going to get roughed up. Um, I would say do watch it, even if you find it uncomfortable to look at, because you have to realize, and this is, this is baby stuff. You know, I could have brought you a picture of a pastor laying naked, dead in the street. You know? I've seen, if, if there's a downside to standing up here and doing this year after year after year, especially when it was when ISIS was walking around, I've seen too much. You can dig deep and find things. There's two images that I can't unsee. All right? People do horrific things to one another. You're just going to see two guys going to get roughed up a little bit. But it's stunning what they do for people, what the tortures are like. What, I mean, burning, setting people on fire. I mean, it's just it's unbelievable what a human can do to another human being. I don't even understand. Well, it's Satan, obviously. It's darkness. And again, it's, you can see there's all those people up there. That's all the darkness, and there's very few lights there, right? So, again, go ahead and watch it. So that's the kind of thing that happens all the time. The guys in the red shirt, those are Hindu leaders, as it were. Um, Those are, I don't know if they're pastors or leaders or something, but it could be just two Christian men, I don't know. But um, they had really uncomfortable days. Since when has the gospel ever been safe? Open, open the book up and tell me, tell me, find pages where it's not there. There's always stories about something, right? I want you to meet somebody else. Ravisha is her name. This is not violent. This is just a sad story. I'm Urvishi, and I'm from Delhi. My childhood was not a very uh, happy childhood. My father never liked me laughing. Uh, and my father never liked me seeing playing with other children. 
I accepted Christ as my personal savior in the first year of my college. My father got behind my life and it was the everyday thing that he used to give money to my elder brother to go and have a drink and he was badly drunk and they both will come and beat me like anything. Every day they will hit me very badly. They will collect all the people from the uh, surroundings and then my father would tell them that I'm a prostitute. And I do prostitution. Just because I believed in Christ. So he was trying to find out some ways to insult me just to throw me out from the family. Nobody used to believe him, but still it was very painful for me and for my brother. He was very helpless like me, but then we both did not lose any courage. We just went on and on. But one day, my father and my elder brother continued beating me for several hours and took me to the nearest police station. 12 o'clock midnight and they just left me there in a very bad condition and they told all the police staff and members that this girl is a prostitute. You can keep this girl here forever and do whatever you want to do with this girl. I was shaken. My heart was broken completely. because that was the cost I was paying for only for Christ in my life. But yes, as I said, God had a plan. He never left me alone. And then at one point, my brother decided that I should get married so that I can have one place where I can stay forever and we don't have to go and hunt for different places to stay and survive. And of course, I'll, I'll have a husband who can take care of me. But then again, the question was that I didn't want to go against against the Bible and I didn't know any Christian boy. My brother had a friend who knew everything about me and my brother. I just went ahead and got married to him. And then uh, on the very first day, I shared the gospel with him and he said yes for that. And we started going to the church and then slowly my husband shared the gospel with my younger brother and he accepted Christ as his personal savior. Then at one point, my husband also shared the gospel with my father and my father also accepted Christ and, and now he is a believer and I am really happy for this miracle though he gave me a very tough time for being a Christian or for believing in Christ I, I just paid a very high price but of course it can never be higher than my Christ the price what he paid to save my life I've watched that half a dozen times and it gives me every time how can you take your daughter and tell everybody that she's a prostitute? The problem, one of the problems with Muslim religion is women are chattel. They are nothing more than something you can use for negotiation. Boys, males, completely different. Women, useless. That's why all these horrific things take place. But and when she said that people didn't believe her, that's a common ruse that men will use for their, their daughters to say, they throw her out and say, well, she's a prostitute. People don't believe it, but they understand what it is she's doing. But to take her to a police station and say, have at it. And then God reaches down and takes all that ugliness, all that darkness, raises him up. Oh. So on this verse, Job 2.10, we're living in the days when there is good from the Lord and we accept it. This is where we're at right now, all right? What's coming, or for these people over there, when there is difficulty, how can we refuse to accept that, all right? So 
two sides of the coin. We're on one side right now. We're heading for the other side. We have to be willing to be able to accept it. All right, so we'll talk about India a little bit. That red line is there. I put that just to delineate north and south because two different things happen in both the north and the south. So there's some very different uh, aspects of India, south, north and south of that line. So in the north, 700 million or 60% of the people, only 15% of them are Christians. In the south, it's 600 million or 40% of the population and 85% of them are Christians. Well, why is that? All right, in the bottom side where 85% of them are Christians, it's nominal Christians, the church and the organizations are very weak. Um, they're a very worldly, um, not unlike we are, not on the same economic level, but weak churches, uh, warm fuzzy messages, just a lot of things that aren't um, strong in the word, and a very small percentage are evangelical. Then the north, Alpha works up here. There's more unreached people groups than any other country. It's actually, there's more unreached people groups by count in India than there is anywhere else in the world, which is pretty interesting. Um, it's very rough terrain, and it's a lot of radical and Hindu uh, fanaticism. Again, this is where Benny and those guys were working. Only 15% of them are Christians. 15% of 700 million people. So there's not a lot of Christians there. So three options in terms of what, how we can help. Now, obviously, they've got 15 different things on their website. But I asked Benny, I said, what do you need? What do you want? What are your primary needs? His single biggest one is this Bible in the Backpack project. And he showed us the video when he was here. They have sent out so many of these backpacks with a Bible in them to the young people. The young people are the future of Christianity. If we don't get them, we're lost. And typically, if you look at especially some Baptist-type statistics and that type of a church, if you can get the kids, you can get the mother. If you can get the mother, they'll come to church. If they'll come to church, you can get the father. If you can get the father, you can save a family. So it's really important to be and that's why we pour into these kids. Again, if you do not understand what takes place up here all the time, you need to just go up there and sit up there some Sunday. It's, just, it's stunning what takes place up there. They're not coloring on coloring papers and being left alone. They're learning the Word of God, typically in the same type of thing that we're learning down here, obviously scaled down, and they're all in the same subject matter, but just age-appropriate. Uh, Frontline messengers, interesting what they're doing they take frontline messengers and they pay them, okay? They have support for them. So, okay, now they're bivocational. So they pay them some money so that they can concentrate on planting churches. Every frontline messenger agrees to plant at least one church a year, okay? Bibles for new believers, basically, that's a given. We needed to be doing that. So the investment for Bibles is $5. It used to be 6 now it's $5. The investment is $100 per messenger per year, and the investment for the Bible and the backpacks is 20 bucks. <clears throat> Benny told me, because I don't care if somebody sends me one check for $5, if that $5 wants to go to a Bible, that's what it's going to go for. He promised me that he said, whatever you send, however you delineate your money, however you designate that money, that's what it's going to be used for. So again, this is just mine. If you go out to the website, you can pick something else if you want to get outside what the Community Chapel is doing just fine. Alpha Ministries has, a prox has an opportunity to reach 100 government schools. This is extraordinary. Notice it says government schools. How is it that the government schools would want to allow a Christian missions to come there and give them? The Bible, the backpacks are there. And I wish, I wish I'm kind of not saying this aloud because you never know who's listening, but they can't put Bibles in the government backpacks in those schools. But he did say, I'm not going to tell you what we're doing. He said, but understand that there will be God-honoring literature inside those backpacks. Now, the ones that are not in the government schools, they'll have a Bible. So here's a little...
17,000 since 2010. That's a lot of backpacks. That's what a lot of kids are touching. good-looking boys there. God's word is alive and spreading. We need to be a part of that. We've always been a part of that. So one of the things the pastor said to me 10 years ago, this is the most important thing we do, supporting the persecuted church. This is what we need to do. There's so many churches. I promise you, I can't think of one. There's probably not two or three churches in the entire upstate this morning that are doing anything beyond maybe saying in their bulletin, International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. It, it, it escapes people completely. I wear this shirt right here. I wear it when I go, especially when I go shopping. People always read it. People are stunned. They read a Bible is illegal in 53 countries. They're like, and you, they don't say anything, but you can tell they're reading their shirt, and they're like, what? And you try it and tell them that. They're like, I didn't know anything about that. They're clueless. They have no idea. And the church is in, as a whole. I can talk about it at church, at, at work. They have no idea about the persecution that takes place for Christians across the globe. Sadly, Americans don't grasp that Christians around the world are so targeted. New York Times, in a piece, they asked the question, are Americans privileged or persecuted? Well, obviously, we're completely privileged. I mean, look at, look at the way we dress. Look at what we do. I filled the car stop and filled my truck up, 80 bucks to fill my truck up. There's over a quarter million dollars of automobiles out here in the parking lot. You're going to go out to lunch afterwards, and you'll probably drop 20, 25 bucks on dinner, on lunch. Or maybe you'll go out to dinner, and you'll spend twice that. We don't think about what we even do. I t- walk out of Sam's the other day, and I asked him, I said, did we spend $50 or $150? I don't even know. I put the credit card in there. And it's there. Pay the bill at the end of the month. We have no idea. We have no idea what it's like to live on that level. No idea. Christianity's dominant role in American culture has obscured the fact that it is the most persecuted faith globally. That's the problem right there. This is a a so-called Christian nation. If you ask somebody, and and you can do this, are you a Christian? They'll say yes, unless they're a Jew, a Muslim, or an atheist. Everybody else says they're Christians, right? That's that's your only option. And besides, I live in America. America's a Christian nation, right? So I must be a Christian, That's the problem. We will be held accountable for what we have and how we've used it, that's for sure. It's not that we are influential in this country. We are. I think that's changing. But we must individually and corporately see to it that more and more people are given the opportunity to possess a Bible. This church has raised extraordinary amounts of money to put out Bibles. I should have put the numbers together on how many Bibles we've donated or had the opportunity to donate in the last five or six years. It's, it's upwards of 50,000 Bibles. It's crazy. Where do they all go? I don't know. But they go out there somewhere. You're, we're responsible for it. And the statistics, I didn't mention it, if you're new, is for every one Bible we can put out there, and this is across all the ministries agree to this, is for every one Bible we can put out there, four to five people can get saved. That's amazing. So it's not how many Bibles you want to get say, put out there. It's how many, how many souls do you want to be involved in saving? So for five bucks, you can have the opportunity to save five people. That's a good return on your investment, right? So the words of our Lord in Luke, to everyone to whom much is given, that is us, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. That's basically the end of this part of the presentation, but this is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. So that's exactly what we're going to do. What I'll do 